Well, hello, and thank you for honoring me with your presence. I hope that tonight's study about Jacob and Israel is very useful to you and inspiring and gives you more hope. And because it's such an involved and lengthy study, so many important points, we're going to start it right now. I've said a number of times here that in the Old Testament, uh, name is character. And this is a perfect example because it's one where it's explicit where after a pivotal event in Jacob's life, he's told by God himself, your name is no longer Jacob, but now Israel. No longer are you the crooked cheater, the supplanter. Now you are the one who struggles with God and has prevailed. He says you've struggled with God and with men, and you have prevailed. Um, you know, we, we can all aspire to that. We all struggle with God. We all struggle with other human beings. Our relationships are not, you know, not smooth. But uh, Jacob has achieved that, and he's, he's, you know, it's kind of like uh, he's tried everything else. And finally, he's found some peace with God and with his brother. But all that's for later in our study. So we'll start, as usual, and we try to do, with uh, the memory text. We came to your brother Esau. Now, he had sent out scouts ahead. He, he, had, he was running from his uh, father-in-law. And he sent out scouts ahead because Esau, he didn't know if he, Esau was still angry with him. It had been 20-some years since he had stolen the birthright and run from his brother, run for his life. Uh, but it, uh, so the, he wanted to know what kind of reception am I going to get. And so he sent out these people ahead of time. And he said, they said, we came to your brother Esau. And furthermore, he's coming to meet you. And 400 men are with him. Now, this may not seem particularly stirring, but 400 men was known as a war clan back in that, that uh, era. And so it's as though he's coming with a battalion or something, a, a large force of armed men. And so there's plenty of reason for him to be concerned. And it's in this context that Esau, I'm sorry, that Jacob is waiting to meet his brother Esau. He goes down to the river Jabbok at night to pray because, you know, he's got some real fence mending to do here. And so he goes down there to pray. And it's interesting because what happens there, as we all know, is this great titanic struggle. He wrestles all night with God. With the, because someone in the form of, of a, a man comes to him and they begin to wrestle and neither one can gain the advantage until just before dawn. And at that point, after all this struggle, you can imagine how exhausted Jacob might have been. Although Jacob, you know, was a goat herder, he was, he was uh, not you know, a young man anymore. But uh, being a shepherd back in those days could be a very uh, stressful occupation, a very physically uh, trying one. So he had the stamina, apparently, to, to wrestle all night. Just before dawn, the, he, he begins to realize that who he's, who's wrestling is, is not just human. And he says, I won't let you go until you bless me. But this, this person reaches down and touches his hip. and pain explodes. He has terrible pain, but he doesn't let go. I won't let you go until you bless me. And the blessing that he gets is largely being told he has a new name, and that means a new character. You have prevailed. God is telling him, you've struggled all this time, but you have prevailed. It's okay. You're ready now. You have a new name. And it's interesting because here we have this explicit encounter with God in the form of this stranger. And as he is, he is heading away from his uh, father-in-law's place, father-in-law Laban and so forth, and that has its own hazards. But he had a huge encounter with uh, God before. 
and that was when he was on his way to his father, his future then father-in-law, Laban, or Laban as some call him. And he was headed up there to look for a bride. Now he had two brides, and he was heading back home at the Lord's command. And so we find that there's a, there's a fascinating similarity between these two episodes. There's a parallel at Bethel, which is what he calls it, after he encounters the what we call Jacob's Ladder. The next morning he makes a cairn of stones in a land full of rocks and stones. He does what you can to make a memorial. And there he builds a cairn, a pile of stones, and he calls it Beit El, the house of God. And so at Beit El, that's where he was. He is fleeing his, he's fleeing his brother when this, this all takes place, what the place he later names Beit El. And by the way, the same thing happens at Peniel, which is by the river Jabbok. He names it after the effect too, because he saw the face of God there. And so in his own life, uh, he, uh, in this uh, narrative, he pauses to name the place. So he's showing us that these are similar places. That he's showing us the parallel. The author of the tale of the, of the account here is telling us by the fact, by Jacob's actions of naming the place, that Jacob recognized these as, uh, recognizes these as parallel events. And it's always helpful when we have these parallel events to compare them to see what's, what we're learning here. At, at Bethel, he was fleeing his brother to go to his uncle. Now he's fleeing his uncle, and he's going to meet his brother. So you can see, this is, it's almost a, a chiastic kind of thing. He's not, but it's, it's, it has that sort of thing. He's moving one way, and then he's moving the other way. But in both cases, on on a part of this journey is uh, one he's leaving from where his brother was to where his uncle will be. Now he's going the other way and he expects to meet his brother after he flees his uncle. And he had stolen his brother's blessing. Uh, this is quite clear, it's explicit. And then what happens is very interesting because not Jacob himself, but Rachel, has stolen the household gods of her father. And Jacob doesn't know this. But of course, this is interesting because uh, in many ways, uh, the same kind of thing, it's a mystery. Uh, Isaac doesn't realize that, that Jacob has stolen the birthright until he's gone. And the same thing happens with Laban in, in the other way around, which he doesn't, re doesn't discover his household gods are gone until he discovers that. Jacob is God. So you have this kind of uh, interesting parallel. Jacob didn't steal the gods, but a member of his household did. Uh, he encounters, Jacob encounters God in the night at Bethel. He, in fact, he, he goes to sleep and he has this dream and he sees this. And during the dream, he hears the voice of God. And God gives him a great blessing. Now, I, was, I mentioned this uh, last week because it's so important to understand that Jacob was at a low point in his life. He had done nothing to deserve a blessing from God. In fact, he had just done some of the most despicable things he would ever do, the most despicable things a person can do. He deceived his blind uh, father. He stole from his brother. I mean, it was, it, it was pretty bad stuff. But God comes to him as he's on the run. God blesses him. Because Jacob needs that blessing. God gives us grace not because we deserve it, but because we need it. So here we are with a parallel. He encounters God in the night at Peniel. But here it's not a dream. At least it's not presented as a dream. It's presented as a real encounter and a wrestling. And he comes back wounded from it because he limps. because His hip was put out of joint. And uh, I don't know what it's like to have your hip out of joint, but uh, I've suffered from sciatica from time to time. And I can tell you it's no fun. And I'm sure there are many in the audience who've had that same experience. It's a very painful thing. So imagine what it's like. So there you are. He encounters God in the night at Peniel. Uh, and he, he names it Peniel because he has seen the face of God, he says, and survived.
at Bethel, God blesses him. He gives him this blessing. He says, wherever you go, I'll be with you, and I'll give you the land. He repeats the blessing uh, that he gives to Abraham in many ways at Bethel, and he blesses Jacob. Even though, again, Jacob is not in a position to say, well, good, I've, I've achieved this, or I I, you know, I, this is the uh, the point in my life at which I I uh, normally would encounter this. He's he's a, at the low point. He's stolen. He's he's uh, deceived. He's he's on the run. But God says, you know, despite your sins, I will still bless you. And and if which of us, how can we imagine that it would be uh, any any use to be any other way? Because if God didn't bless us while we are sinners. How would we ever be blessed? How would there ever be uh, any blessing for us? Because it just we're just <laughs> desperate creatures. We're always in sin. All right. The same thing happens at Peniel. God blesses him. So you see the parallels here. He makes an agreement with Laban. When this is all done, he goes and he meets Laban. And he ends up making an agreement to work for a wife and we'll go into the details on that but he goes to and he's there he's deceived you see there's this deception involving the firstborn because leah is firstborn there's deception involving the firstborn on both ends of the bethel journey both the one that starts him out and at the end of the bethel journey and at peniel he's fleeing his uncle he's leaving god told him to, to go but uh, laban was not uh, eager to let go this uh, source of his wealth. That's made very clear in the in the narrative is that uh, Jacob, everything Jacob does is blessed by God. And his flocks increase and Laban doesn't want Leah. In fact, he claims these are all mine. These are my flocks. These are my daughters. Every, it's all mine. And Jacob says, wait a minute. That's not the way it works. I work for them. You never suffered any loss because of me and so forth. So, and he makes another agreement with Laban. But this is the one I grew up. Uh, my first years were in Texas. I was born in Texas. And there at uh, what is now Southwestern University in Keene, Texas, is what's called the Mizpah Gate. Uh, it's a beautiful, uh, at least it was. I hear it's been vandalized, but it was a beautiful, and I think they've been repaired. Uh, a lot of uh, petrified wood, and it's a beautiful gate. But the Mizpah, I learned it growing up, the Mizpah, as a beautiful blessing. The Lord watch between me and thee while we are absent one from another. Doesn't that sound sweet? But if you read the story, it's quite different than that. They build a cairn again. They build another cairn. I could have included that in the the parallel because they the two of them built this monument. And what they're really saying is, because it's very clear from the text, he says, you know, Laban says, well, okay, I won't come across this this border. This is the border between the two of us. And I won't come across this line to do harm to you, and you won't come across this line to do harm to me. And what he's really saying is that uh, uh, God's going to have to to, uh, to watch over us because I can't keep my eye on you. It's quite the opposite. But it still sounds like a beautiful blessing. But it's, may God, you know, God keep you to your agreement here. That's what they're really saying. The Lord watch between between us while we're absent. We can't look at each other. We can't watch each other. We can't um, assure the other ones. But, but we're saying God's going to do that. So if we cross over this line uh, to do harm to the other one, God will punish. That's the idea. But he makes this agreement. He builds a uh, cairn, and uh, in this case, he makes another agreement with Laban. And so you could say in some ways this bookends his, uh, and in fact, uh, in terms of the text, it does bookend his relationship with Laban. Uh, and it also, as we shall, shall, shall see, uh, bookends his relationship in many ways with Esau. Now I mentioned this out in both cases here. In both cases, in the first case, Jacob is running and is, uh, he, you know, he's guilty and he's ashamed and all of these things. And God reaches out to bless him with Jacob's ladder. And here in, uh, in Peniel, it's the opposite situation. He's running, but he's coming back to make amends 
with his brother. And uh, he doesn't know how he'll be received. His brother is coming with 400 armed men, remember, what, what could be called a war clan in those days. And so he has reason to be concerned. And God again reaches out to him. And so we see this is the key to the lesson. It's a key to Jacob's entire life. God reaches out to Jacob when he needs it most. And I can tell you from my life that God has reached out to me. I haven't always been receptive. I certainly have had the experience of wrestling with God in the physical sense. But it's often when we're struggling the most internally. We're actually struggling with God. Why are you allowing this to happen to me? And in my personal life, I can tell you God has reached out uh, when I need it the most. I don't always recognize it, but later I do. Uh, you know, I like to quote Sjorin Kierkegaard, who said, life must be lived forwards, but it's understood backwards. And so oftentimes we don't see that God has been reaching out until after the, the episode, until after it passes. Well, we have also, I, I looked this up, I thought, well, am I the only one who's seen a parallel between Israel, this Jacob, as he's returning, the returning brother, and the prodigal son? And uh, no, there's a whole book written on it. It's quite good. I didn't have time to read it, but I, I got the basic idea from it. But I, I, I'd come up with this idea on my own, but I want to say, am I crazy? I look. So uh, some of you who think I take some odd positions, I go and uh, find out, is this, is this unique to me? Is this something that somebody else has thought of? And apparently, uh, it's a good book by a man named Bailey. Uh, and it, he points out that Jesus is in the prodigal son is retelling the story of Israel. This story, well, I don't mean Israel in general. I mean this story of Jacob as Israel returning. And he's, but he's putting a twist on it. He's putting a twist on the whole thing because Jacob was the younger brother. Israel's the younger brother. Uh, he didn't uh, take his. He didn't take his uh, inheritance. He took his brother's inheritance early. Uh, but we'll see. There, there are more parallels. But sometimes, as we've seen before, parallels can be opposites, and that's what we're going to see some of here. So he had taken from his father and from his brother because in, in Israel, I say this because uh, it was something that that uh, that altered their relationship as well. And the prodigal had taken his share of the inheritance, which means it probably wasn't just money. It was probably the value of animals, and they may have had to sell them. And of course, the flocks and herds would be reduced by that much. And so what was left would be smaller. In other words, it wouldn't grow as fast. Uh, just as if you took uh, investment, say that you had two sons and you had money invested uh, in, in uh, stocks and bonds, and one of them took their share, you'd take that out. Well, that wouldn't be growing for you anymore. So he'd, he'd taken from both of them, the prodigal had. Israel had become wealthy. He'd become very wealthy. When he encounters Esau, he's going to give Esau over 600 animals, all told. Uh, that's not a small number even today. So he's going to give them, he's, he'd become quite wealthy, because apparently he had quite a bit left when that was done. Um, the prodigal had become destitute. And it's interesting because Jacob, returning as Israel, is feeling destitute. He approaches Esau as a, a debtor. He approaches Esau in recognition of what he's stolen from his brother. And he approaches him not as the firstborn who uh, should rule over the family, but as one who should be ruled, who is uh, acknowledging the authority of his brother Esau. It's a fascinating situation. Uh, you might say that... Uh, and of course, this is not uh, not accurate in a way, but uh, Esau's investment of selling the birthright uh, for a pot of stew had come back, and that investment had paid off. But of course, it, uh, the, the blessing of God is not something to be bought or sold. In both cases, they return home. 
And Israel, he humbles himself. He, he says, he, he approaches his brother, and, and I am your servant, and goes on about this. So he is he's accepting the, his what would have been considered in the culture his right for all. He still is going to be the one through whom the uh, lineage to the Messiah passes. He will be the, the chosen one in that sense. But um, he, uh, he comes and humbles himself. Of course, the prodigal says, you know, I'm willing to be a servant. But in his own mind, we're told this. He's willing to be a servant. Uh, he doesn't have, he, he doesn't expire being his son anymore. And what happens is the brother forgives. When Israel meets Esau, his brother forgives him. He will meet his father, and his father will forgive him too. But right now, this, this episode is here. And what happens in the, the parable of the prodigal son is that the father forgives, the brother does not. And this is one of the uh, issues here is that the prodigal son is really not a parable about the prodigal son. We call it that, and we see that, but actually that's not what it's about. Every parable I was taught in the seminary, and I believe it's accurate, has one main point. We can elaborate and go as far as we want, but that doesn't mean that that's what the, the passage is teaching primarily. And so Luke has three parables. The lost sheep is the first one. Luke 15, this is where the prodigal son appears. And the, and the prodigal son is the third of the three parables. In the lost sheep, the 90 and 9, we have a song about it. It's a beautiful song. Uh, the sheep is returned. The shepherd goes out and finds the sheep. And when the sheep is returned, the neighbors rejoice because the one which is lost had been found. The lost coin is the next one, a woman who's not wealthy, but she has ten coins. That is her wealth. And one coin is lost, and so she searches for that one coin all through the house. And when she finds it, the neighbors rejoice. And this is really the what we call the prodigal son is the lost brother. The brother returns, but the elder brother does not rejoice. That's what sets the third parable apart. It's not that something is lost or that something is returned. It's that there's no rejoicing. Jesus is telling these parables to the Pharisees because he wants them to understand there's something wrong here. When I bring back the lost brothers, you don't Rejoice. And of course, this is, uh, this is important. Uh, because Jesus in this parable then is portraying the Jews as far worse than Esau. If they see this parallel, that uh, the returning Jacob, returning Israel, uh, is uh, forgiven by Jacob, but the returning son in the parable is not forgiven, is not rejoiced over then they're in a worse position as, than, uh, than Esau. And that would have had to be shocking to them. And something that is important for me to say, I am someone who has never left the church. I did for a time cease to attend. That's another story. But I did not consider myself leaving the faith. The point is that those of us who stay, those of us who stay in the church are the ones who form the church boards and the church executive, the conference executive committees, and we're the ones who are the delegates. I can't say this in a, a delicate way. You and I are the elder brothers. You and I are. And we are prone to what the elder brother in the parable does. That is to say, the lost come in, we don't rejoice. We condemn them. I see too much of this in my life. I've seen a great deal of it. And uh, have I participated in it? Probably more than I would like to think. But it's important to understand that this parable in Luke 15 is not about the brother, the brother who goes away. It's about the unforgiving attitude of the brother's who stay, brothers and sisters. You know, there's always somebody, I've seen this in many, many churches, someone who considers himself a guardian, 
to make sure that the undesirables don't come into the church. But those are the very people that Jesus is reaching out to. Because the undesirables know they need help. And we, as the elder brothers, need to keep this in mind. We need to be understanding that God is working in ways which often make us uncomfortable. But again, the faithful and true witness in Revelation tells us that our comfort is our problem. God isn't working for our comfort. He's working for our salvation. So here we are. Jesus portrays the Jews as far worse when they hear this parable. And many of them, they, they have memorized the Old Testament, some of them. They know this story very well, the story of Jacob and Esau. It's foundational to their history as a people, their identity. And so this is a key truth here. Jesus portrays the Jews as far worse than Esau. We, too, can be far worse than the people we set out, we believe, are sinners. Because it is our unforgiving attitude that is such a problem. Shechem. Now, it talks in your lesson about the defilement of Dinah, and it talks about uh, several other things, but it, it all revolves around Shechem. Shechem is an interesting place because it was between Mount uh, Gerizim and Mount Ebal. And that a lot of things will happen at those between those two mountains, on those two mountains. At this place, it will its name will change. It won't be called Shechem, but it, it will be a, a really important one. And, and Jacob wants to settle down. He buys land here. He intends to stay here. The problem is that it's really not where he's supposed to be. He's supposed to go back to his father. He's supposed to go back to Hebron and to Beersheba, where, where uh, Jacob and, and uh, Abraham had lived. He's supposed to go down to the around Jerusalem, for example. Shechem is well north of this. In fact, Shechem is going to be uh, the place of Samaria. So Shechem is going to be in a, this 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 place is going to be a really important place, and in fact, by the time uh, Jesus comes along, it's called Sychar, and there's something really important here. But Shechem is also the name of the, uh, the the son of the man who founded Shechem, and there he uh, takes Dinah by force sexually. And so it, it sets off a, a series of events that will have a lasting effect upon Jacob and upon the promised land. Simeon and Levi defile circumcision. They say, well, we can't, because Shechem says it, he loves Dinah. He speaks um, comfortingly to her. Now, I don't want to, and no matter what I say here, I'm going to get myself in trouble. But I have to say the truth, which is it would have been perfectly acceptable in that culture if uh, Jacob had simply sold Dinah to Shechem as his bride. And then uh, if, if he had taken her sexually, it would have been all right. I'm not saying that it was something that I think we should approve of. I'm saying that that culture wouldn't have looked on it that way. It was happening. It happens in Scripture. Um, it's not to approve it. It's simply to say this is where the culture was. And they, and so the fact that Shechem, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't uh, despise her. He doesn't throw her out. Don't forget, later on, uh, Amnon, David's son, is going to take his, uh, his half-sister Tamar, and he's going to despise her and, and cast her away. Well, this is a terrible thing, first of all, but the, to to take her uh, against her will, and then to to spurn her in that culture would be a terrible thing. So Shechem at least wants to make things right as they see it in their culture. He's going to pay for her. He'll pay whatever it takes, he says. And Simeon and Levi say, well, okay, but we couldn't have her marry anybody who wasn't circumcised like us. 
And Shechem agrees to do that. And they, uh, in fact, they circumcise every, all the males who live in the city of Shechem. And as they're recovering, and they probably use wine in my book on uh, Torn Jacob's story, the book of Jacob's life, I talk about this. They probably used wine, and they probably used, they already were aware of the, uh, uh, like cocaine. They, they just used a, a white paste from uh, the leaves of certain plants, and it, had, it was pretty high content of cocaine. They probably used something like, we know that the, this was used in those days as a painkiller. And so they may well have done that. And here they are. Some of them are doped. Some of them are drunk. But they're all recovering from the pain. And Simeon and Levi go into Shechem and kill every adult male, every one, who are weakened by circumcision. And this is a terrible thing that they have done because they've taken something which is supposed to be a holy sign of their Loving relationship with God. That was the whole purpose of circumcision, is to remember that God is their God, and they belong to him, and that all, all children come from God. And they, they use that as a weapon to kill the male population, the adult male population of Shechem. And um, it says that Jacob is upset, that everybody, everybody around is upset. But you can't, God must be upset, too. Because God does not like it when we take things which are supposed to be holy and we misuse them in such an egregious fashion. So they have essentially defiled circumcision. What was supposed to be most holy, they had turned into something which was uh, despicable. Uh, much like rape does the same thing to marriage. This is, there's a lot of defilement going on here. It's not a good thing. And because they bring all of the plunder here, including the uh, gods, the idols, uh, into the camp, they have defiled the camp. Now they've repudiated God in a couple of ways. They've, repu they've used the sign of their relationship with him uh, as a weapon in order to, uh, to kill people even though, again, Shechem had offered to pay. I mean, again, you don't have to like it to realize that he was doing what he was doing the best he could under the situation, the culture, and they, they took something sacred and used it as a weapon. This is a terrible thing to do. Then they brought in all the idols, all the plunder, all the slaves. Uh, women and children probably came into the camp. And, of course, what was going to happen was that, uh, you know, Jacob says, well, now they're all, all the people around are going to come by and they're going to come and exterminate us, which is a very likely thing. And, and the other thing is that uh, anywhere he settled, he would, have, he would make enemies just by coming in. You heard what happened in Shechem, didn't you? Can't trust these people. So Simeon and Levi had done a terrible thing. They had defiled the camp. And then Reuben... Defi defiles Bilhah. Now, this is there are several events here, and they're presented differently in the lesson because uh, he's taking things strictly in a chronological order. But it's not much later; it's the same, a very close time and period, period in time when Reuben goes in and he has relations with Bilhah, who is his father's concubine. Now, the author of the lesson says, well, you know, we can't understand why this was done except just out of lust. Well, that's a possibility, but it's also a possibility as we saw. Later, again, using this uh, this as a uh, template in many ways of what happens with David and Absalom. Uh, David does not react to the rape of Tamar. So Absalom does. He kills his brother. But then at one point, the, uh, the counselors that Absalom has assembled tell him to take his father's concubines. David has uh, been driven from Jerusalem, and uh, Absalom is still there. And Absalom takes the concubines, which is what a king would do. This is what uh, David did when Solomon died. He took all of Solomon's wives as his own, uh, largely because this was a matter of state. And so when Absalom goes and takes uh, the, uh, his father's wives, he is claiming to be king. 
And so I believe what's happening here with Reuben is that he's deciding that his old man isn't up to it anymore, and Reuben will now be the head of household. And he does this by taking Bilhah. Uh, he's not going to do it by taking his mother. That's uh, something that's not well looked on, although don't forget that um, uh, Jacob and uh, Rachel and Leah were cousins. Uh, it was very common in those days for cousins to marry. Uh, it still is in parts of the Mideast, and sometimes they import this custom uh, undercover to the Western countries. But Reuben defines, defiles Bilha, and the results of all this has long-term consequences uh, for Jacob and his family. In the middle of this, Rachel dies, and, and Jacob buries her, but she dies giving birth to Benjamin. Of course, Benjamin, she calls him son of sorrow, Ben Moami. Uh, she gives birth to Benjamin, uh, but uh, Jacob renames him Benjamin, son of the right hand, which is always interesting to me because every Benjamite, when we know his, uh, whether he's right or left handed, he's left handed. Uh, Saul, who is a Benjamite, we don't know if he's left handed or not, but he has, we are told that he has an army of 700 left handed stone throwers from the tribe of Benjamin. It's a fascinating situation. Anyway, and uh, I have my own son uh, is named Benjamin, and he's ambidextrous, which is uh, always fascinating to me. Not important, but, but interesting to me. So Rachel dies, and that's the end of the great love of... What happens in all this is very simple. And then we talked about this now several times because the, the 12 sons of Jacob matter. We, and they're going to matter a lot as time goes on. There'll be 12 tribes of, of uh, Israel. And, of course, the Levites don't count as a tribe at all. But the Levites are always messing up. But Reuben was the firstborn. But he no longer, he has forfeited the blessing of being the one who carries the family forward because of his action. He, when he takes uh, Bilhah. So he has disqualified himself. So that's the first thing. He's not going to have the first, he's not going to have the birthright. <clears throat> uh, Simeon and Levi are, they're always, con they're, they're, you know, confederates in crime, and they have also invalidated their claim. They would be next, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, but they've all done terrible things, which means that they're not eligible. And although Joseph is Rachel's firstborn, he will not have a tribe. The only time Joseph is mentioned as having a tribe is in Revelation, interestingly enough. Joseph, of course, means fruitful, because after 20-some years of barrenness, Rachel finally has a child herself. And she says, I am fruitful. Now I am fruitful. So there you are. And that means that the firstborn, the one who will carry the family forward, will be Judah. That's what all of this comes down to. It doesn't mean there are no other important things to be learned here. We've already seen a couple. But it does mean that uh, this, this is the result for the family. Judah will be the progenitor. And interestingly enough, the two tribes that form the country of Judah, when the ten tribes go uh, and are, are eventually dispersed and, and never heard of again. It's Judah and Benjamin. Those are the two that are left. Uh, neither one the firstborn, but they're the two royal tribes. Benjamin is the tribe of Saul, and Judah is the tribe of David and the Davidic line, which will eventually produce the Messiah. So you see how this, this, uh, this plays out. It's a fascinating thing. And these events are all, you know, you're saying, well, how do you know these things matter like that? Well, we'll get into this in a second here. But here we are. Many things happen in Shechem, most of the bad for Israel. I'm telling you, the list is almost endless. Uh, there, there may be 19 or 20 things in Scripture. I don't know exactly how many that happen at this place. It's, it's a, a when, uh, in Deuteronomy, when Moses has the tribes line up, he has six of them on Mount Ebal and six of them on Mount Gerizim, the two mountains that are at Shechem. 
There are battles fought here. There are, there are engagements that take place here. There are all kinds of things that happen, even though, as I say, the names change and other things happen. This, uh, most of them are bad, but interestingly enough, because of the way scripture is structured, uh, the last one that I'm aware of in Shechem is after it's been named Sychar, and this is where Jesus meets the woman at the well. So, uh, and it's Jacob's well. Do you know Jacob drilled the well or dug a well while he was there? And so it, it, it all makes uh, perfect sense. So many things will happen in Shechem. And this is the first one that's really that's really uh, recorded. So this is setting uh, a tone, and you'll see how this works in, in a minute here. Because in First Corinthians ten, Paul tells us, "Now these things happen." I put call this the importance of Genesis because you notice we've had a lot of keys and a lot of key truths. Several of the lessons have had four. There are a lot of key truths because Genesis is setting the agenda for the rest of scripture in many ways. Now, these things happen to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. 1 Corinthians 10, all these things happen as examples to us, and we see how these things are very far back in history, a long ways back. The very First actions of the patriarchs, because you know Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the third patriarch. He's the first one to have multiple heirs, uh, who will be part of the promise. But the, many of these things uh, have consequences and set the pattern, which will be repeated again and again through Scripture. It's why Genesis is so crucially important. These are foundational examples of how God works with humankind and how humans react to God and to other situations. So that's a key point in this lesson. And that really brings us now to the fourth. There have been four keys. God reaches out to Jacob when he needs it most, not because Jacob deserves it, because he needs it most. Jesus in the prodigal son is reaccounting the story of Jacob returning, but he's showing the Jews that as the elder brothers, they are far worse than Esau. As we said, many things happen in Shechem. Most of them are bad for Israel. Shechem will be a place where again and again, if you pay attention as we go through the narrative, the story of Scripture, you will see, oh, here it is again. There's this thing that happens right here, the same place where this massacre took place in the book of Genesis. And that's because all of these things are foundational examples of how God works with humankind. The Bible is story first. Until you understand that, you won't understand the Bible. And here we have in this story four more examples. Again, there's, there's everything it seems, and we could probably make five or six out of the last several lessons each, because these actions will have they will reverberate. They will echo down the ages, even to the end of the world. Upon their examples for us, upon whom the ends of the world have come. That is not something that he says lightly. And so, although some people, my wife is so, it's not Genesis again. I spend I spend an awful lot of time in Genesis in the last ten or fifteen years, but everything in Genesis is so significant for the plan of salvation. And that's why we spend time here. And the better we understand it, the better we understand. Thank you for joining me. There are many ways that you can support this ministry. Uh, and I really, uh, we appreciate all the support. Uh, please subscribe. Uh, we have over 400 subscribers now. I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Um, if you like it, uh, press the like button. Other people will know. Share it. Let people, uh, if you find this useful, share it and let them uh, ex experience it as well. You can pray for us. Uh, if you want to, you can get more, more information, more material like this that's not available generally at my Patreon uh, page. You see it at the bottom of the page there, patreon.com slash Bible Journeys. 
And you can reach me uh, via email at BibleJourneys at Yahoo.com. Thank you for joining me. I hope that we can uh, go again on another Bible journey in just a few days. And until then, may God bless.